Dr. Mitch Elkis has been a longtime mentor of mine and just a fa fantastic person, a fantastic teacher and mentor and a fantastic practitioner. And um, I think just thinks about this topic and, and the concepts we'll be talking about tonight in such unique, wonderful ways. I can't wait to hear what he has to share with us tonight. He will be talking about prom promoting mental health the holistic approach of acupuncture and consciousness. And I'll just introduce uh, Dr. Elkis by reading his bio. He is retired from a private practice of integrative neurology after 38 years. He is board certified in neurology, medical acupuncture, and board certified in osteopathic manipulative medicine. He's a clinical associate professor in Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine and is currently co-director of the Medical Acupuncture for Physicians course, the Helms Medical Institute. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Jen, very much for this opportunity of being a part of the mini medical school for the public, from psychology to soil science, from Ayurvedic medicine to psilocybin to yoga and breath work, and now promoting mental health the holistic approach of acupuncture and consciousness. Well, what am I talking about mental health? This is the emotional, psychological, and social well-being of an individual, how we think, how we feel, and how we act, how we handle stress, how we relate to others, and how we make choices. Sure, there are biologic factors, like things we inherit from our family, things that occur along the way, interpreting our genes, biochemical factors within our individual bodies, there are life experiences, traumatic events, physical and mental, psychological abuse, extraordinary stressors, and of course, there's family history, things that run in your family. So when we talk about mental health, when I talk about mental health, I'm talking about more than just mental health. I'm talking about health, because mental health is general health. Mental health is a part of your physical health, and physical health is a part of your mental health. This quote is from Sally Rosenberg, my wife. She taught me, she's a psychiatrist, she taught me that patients many times must learn or be taught how to constructively seek and receive help, to receive support, to receive help, and to receive attention. Now, I want to say a word about acupuncture. Acupuncture is the use of fine filiform, I had to look that word up, by the way, it means thread-like, single-use needles to affect the living organism. This is pretty profound when we think about what we're talking about. This is a picture of what the needles look like. Their packaging is on the left. On that stone, you see different size needles, handles, and shapes. Here you see a relative size, a matchstick on the top, a medical syringe with a cutting edge next, a sewing needle after that, and finally the acupuncture needle, 0.25 millimeters in diameter. Off to the left, you see some 10,000-year-old bone needles from China. This is where the first idea of acupuncture came around. Now, acupuncture is an ancient tradition. It's very low in technology. Minimal tools are required. It's inexpensive and widely available. It involves a hands-on interaction with a trained caregiver. This is pretty remarkable when I learned this, that 40% of the effect of the needle, 40% of the effect of the treatment is due to the needle, and 60% is nonspecific, meaning that 60% of the therapeutic effect of acupuncture is due to the relationship between the practitioner and the patient. And there's the source of that. So this is the key. There's time spent with someone listening, looking, examining, and offering treatment. Now, in the context of equity, acupuncture is affordable. The needles are inexpensive. The technology is low. There are community clinics with sliding scales. Group treatments are available. Accessibility. It can be present in every type of primary care practice. Of availability. It could certainly be present in every community. And scalability. The idea of being able to scale up this amount of intervention to reach larger and larger numbers of people is the idea. Group treatment, treatment th from physicians, DOs, or MDs, and the training they get is through the AAMA and certification through the ABMA, through physician alternatives, licensed acupuncturists, oriental medical doctors, 
nurse practitioners, advanced nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and they get their certification from the NCCAOM. And when you're looking for practitioners, look for certification from the ABMA and the NCCAOM. The goal of acupuncture is to restore and maintain system-wide dynamic balance. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple in words, pretty powerful in context. It's prevention-oriented. Matter of fact, the thing that attracted me to acupuncture was when I first learned in 1972 that it's the superior physician that prevents diseases, that treats the patient before their diseases are ever shown up at all, when they're just imbalances in the system. So it's prevention-oriented. There's a home treatment component to it. Once you've done the treatment in your office, there's home exercise that's given to the patient, home massage, channel massage, heat application, beads and seeds and magnets that can be used at home. And there's a fair amount of education regarding therapeutic diet, therapeutic activity, therapeutic sleep and rest, and of course, mental health. Now, acupuncture for mental health, as I reviewed some of the literature, for anxiety, there's a systematic review of acupuncture and electroacupuncture for anxiety. These are, these are big studies that I'm now refer, referencing. For depression, a large systematic review and meta-analysis. For stress, another systematic review and meta-analysis. And all of these showed effectiveness of acupuncture on anxiety disorder, on depression disorder. And that is the bottom line. Acupuncture can be used successfully for mental health. Now, what is acupuncture? Acupuncture points are these high conducting, low resistance points. They have low palpatory resistance. They're soft little hollows and clefts along the major structures. They occur along the planes, along the tendons, near the nerves and arteries and veins. And they're in the loose tissue around the important structures. We never put our needles into a bone or into a tendon or into a nerve or an artery. It's always in the loose connective tissue or the fascia around it. Fascia is connective tissue. Now the acupuncture meridians are in fact defined by the fascial planes between muscles and organs. And the fascial planes exist between and within all tissues. If you were to dip someone in a dissolving solution that took away everything that was fascia and left everything else, you would see a totally intact human being just missing their compartments. And the fascia begins at the time of the first two cellular organism. There's one cell becomes two cells and in between them is a space in between. That's the connecting tissue of those first two cells. And from those first two cells, it keeps going on until you become the whole human being that you are. And the interstitium comes all the way to the surface and represents the meridians. Now, how does manual acupuncture work? Acupuncture by hand. Helene Langevin, the current head of the National Center for Complementary Integrative Health, demonstrated that by rotating the needle, you could deform the loose connective tissue. And you can see this is a, a picture of loose connective tissue that's been twisted with a needle. And you see it like spaghetti around a fork. And that when you twist the connective tissue, which is mostly collagen, that this results in a fascial deformation signal. This is a signal that something's going on. And that triggers the manual acupuncture effect. Now with electrical acupuncture, it's a little bit different. Electrical acupuncture is conducted along the fascia, what's called the perineural transmission network. So this is the fascia around the nerves. On the right, you see nerve bundles and nerve fibers surrounded by perineurium, loose CT or loose connective tissue, epineurium, dense connective tissue, but it's along the connective tissue planes that electrical acupuncture is conducted. So again, fascia is the mechanism. Manual acupuncture by fascia, electrical acupuncture by fascia. The thing about electrical acupuncture and this acupuncture structural approach is that it affects the microglia. And now the microglia are immune cells that live within the nervous system. And they are the immune cells that patrol the nervous system to remove toxic byproducts and metabolites and things that could damage the nervous system. One of the newer notions about acupuncture is that the nervous system is essential for acupuncture to work. And this is a picture that Peter Dorsher had created. And you can see the blue dots on the right are the acupuncture points on the back and the little yellow thread-like structures next to them are the nerves that supply those points. Similarly, on the front of the torso, the picture on your left, you see the points in black and pink, and you can see the nerves in yellow representing the innervation of the acupuncture points. And acupuncture's neuroanatomic and physiologic basis was the basis of this article that he wrote last year, a brilliant article. 
And it shows that the peripheral nervous system defines the channels and the points, that an intact nervous system is necessary and sufficient for the acupuncture to work. So if you do acupuncture in a limb that's disconnected by nerves from the trunk or below a spinal cord transection, electroacupuncture will not work. Now, the other thing about acupuncture that in my life uh, in the 60s first raised attention was the work from Bruce Pomerantz and Robert Chang at Toronto that showed that if you put a rat on a hot plate, not a nice thing to do, but the, where the tail is, it's on, it's, there's a little hot probe or a little heated light that comes out of there. And I see how long that rat will keep its tail in that position without flicking it away from the heat. And what they do is that they give acupuncture where that little finger of the human being is over the right rear paw of the rat. And when they give acupuncture with electricity, the rat keeps its tail on the hot plate a lot longer. They found out that if they pre-treat that rat with Narcan, which as everybody knows now is a antagonist of opioids, that they can block electroacupuncture. So this was the first proof that part of the effectiveness of electroacupuncture was through the endorphin receptors. In other words, it's mediated by endogenous opiates, endorphins. The other big neurochemical signature of acupuncture is serotonin. So this review article showing the effects of acupuncture and serotonin metabolism was from 2016, but it shows that acupuncture reliably increases the release of serotonin. Serotonin is a feel-good hormone, warm, glowing, good mood, well-being, and this contributes to the relief of anxiety and depression that we see with acupuncture. One further aspect of acupuncture and its explanations has come with the valued uh, advancing of neuroimaging, functional neuroimaging. So here you see a picture on the left of a functional brain image that shows a person in pain and all that white area is lit up and activated. The two middle pictures are after sham acupuncture and real acupuncture. And in both cases, you see that the white signal has gone down in the top part of the brain considerably. And also in the territory right below the the center of the brain where the thalamus is, you can see the thalamic nuclei pointed to by the arrow. The thalamic nuclei go from bright white to not so bright white when you give meridian acupuncture, which is true acupuncture. So this now shows an in a live person, not a dead rat or a sacrificed rat, but in a live person, you can demonstrate in vivo effects of acupuncture while the person's on the table. Now, what about stress? You know, stress is an interesting thing. Just the right amount of it is good. Homeostasis is our body's ability to manage the internal milieu of our internal space. Our body chemistry, body acidity, body temperature, body uh, elemental composition. Allostasis is, is externalities that are imposed on the body that force the body to respond. So it turns out that the upside down U is on the vertical axis is performance, on the horizontal axis is stress level. At the far left, with no stress, there's no performance. It's lame, person's inactive and bored. With a little bit of stress, there's some healthy tension and motivation. And peak performance requires a certain amount of stress for peak performance to be focused. After that, however, now there's fatigue and exhaustion and stress overload, burnout and breakdown. So too much stress is not good. Stress is managed in the human, this is the medical school part, by the sympathetic nervous system. This is through adrenaline that squirts into your blood, the sign of stress, increases your blood circulation rate, increases your respiration rate, increases your carbohydrate metabolism, prepares your muscles for exertion. At the same time, the hypothalamus triggers a release from your pituitary gland of cortisol, uh, actually ACTH from your pituitary gland, and cortisol from your adrenal glands. That furthers the process of preparing to run or fight, your pupils dilate, your heart beats faster, your blood pressure goes up, your metabolism accelerates, and a certain amount of anti-inflammatory activity is triggered. Now that's the sympathetic, the fight or the flight. In contradiction to that is the vagal or the parasympathetic. This, instead of speeding the heart, slows the heart. This is rest and digest instead of fight or flight. This moves food through the intestines. This is reg regulated by acetylcholine. Now on the picture on the right, you see that the vertical axis is the arousal intensity. And with arousal intensity in the pink zone in the middle, you have fight or flight, which we've discussed. If the arousal is so great that you're afraid of your imminent 
extinction, the first thing, it's an overwhelming thing, and there's a freezing response. It's a deer in the headlights, the possum playing dead, it's preparation for death, it's a feeling of hopelessness, and it's the vagal nerve, the dorsal vagal nerve that freezes you down. And it's an older vagal representation. A newer evolutionary development of the vagal nerve is the ventral vagal complex. complex. Before it developed, your only choices were to fall faint on the ground, run or fight with anybody that came up to you. But if you wanted to have some kind of social engagement, you needed something more. So the ventral vagal complex developed to take care of the throat and the pharynx and larynx to like do uh, 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 guttural stuff to the begin the social engagement. And this allows joyful activity in the present, a curiosity, a, a trying to communicate with other people, a sense of compassion and mindfulness. And it turns out that in this stage of extraordinary stress that the freezing response comes back so that people that are totally stressed out sometimes are shut down. And let's talk about this vagus nerve parasympathetic. We monitor vagal activity because most people tend to have too much sympathetic, not enough parasympathetic. So their vagus nerve is not enough. So we monitor heart rate variability as a sign, HRV as a sign of vagal activity. The higher the heart rate value variability, the higher the vagal nerve tone, the better you are. The loss of heart rate variability is an early sign of poor vagal tone. And it can be measured on an EKG. Normally when you breathe in, the heart beats get closer together. And when you breathe out, the heart beats get farther apart. That's called sinus, respiratory sinus arrhythmia. That's normal. When you lose that, that's a sign of losing vagal tone. And you need vagal tone to survive. These are things you can do to bring back your vagal tone. Breathe in at a count of four, breathe out at a count of eight against resistance. Ujjayi breathing, yogic breathing, sniper breathing, where you breathe in and then you breathe out against resistance as you're steadying and slowing your arch. Gorilla walk, where you stand and let your body hang forward, your arms hanging low so that you increase your intrathoracic pressure. That increases vagal tone as well. Kundalini yoga, putting your face in cold water, all those things. So that stress, what about consciousness? Well, according to the dictionary, consciousness is a state of being awake and aware of one's surroundings. A quality or state of being aware, especially something within oneself. The state of being characterized by sensation, emotion, volition, and thought. Or according to Merriam-Webster, the upper level of mental life in which the person is aware as contrasted with unconscious processes. Well, I'm gonna present something different than that. I'm gonna tell you that consciousness is not a cognitive function. I'm gonna tell you that I believe that consciousness is an affective function, an emotional function, and that the content of consciousness is affect, and that you can disrupt this whole conscious activity with a brainstem lesion. So affect or emotional response, visceral response is a homeostatic function. The homeostatic deviation creates the arousal and the allostatic stress produces survival. What's apparently the case is that this affective system is 100 million years old, and psychopathology is the result of emotions remaining imbalanced. So in the context of a therapeutic relationship, old stuck emotional behaviors can be re-experienced and reconsolidated. And that can occur in a treatment with medical acupuncture, psychotherapy, EMDR, et cetera. Now, what are instinctual affects? These are things you're born with. Sensory, your ability to taste, touch, smell, sound, feel pain. Homeostatic, the internal milieu that you're paying attention to, uh, thirst, air, hunger, these are all monitored by enteroreceptors, which are usually the territory of the vagus nerve. And then of course, there's the emotional, the external milieu. This is old limbic system, old brain, midbrain, brain stem, and cerebellum that trigger this. And I'll go into detail what I'm talking about. But before I do, this came up last week in the discussion of yoga about knowing oneself. And interoception is the sense of oneself. It's the ability to understand your physical signals telling you when you're hungry or full, thirsty or not, hot or cold, scared or calm. Interoception refers to the body's ability to identify and process the internal action of the organs and systems within the body. In other words, to know how you're feeling. So interoceptive awareness is being aware of how you feel. Now here at Osher, UCSF, they have the multidimensional assessment of interoceptive awareness, the MAIA exam, the testing exam, psychometric exam, which is a predictor of outcomes. 
and emotional regulation capacity. What do I mean by that? Well, emotions are behaviors. There's negative ones, the kind that an animal won't want, won't, if they have an electrode to, causing it in their brain, they won't want to repeat that stimulation. Negative ones are things like fear, anxiety, sadness, separation, anger, rage. Positive things are things that they would keep pressing the stimulation electrode because they like it. Things that are joyful, playful, caring for others or lusty. These are dopamine driven. They're seeking and searching. Now, emotional regulation, I suggested that the emotion comes from this area of the brain that's called the insula, where your awareness is, and the amygdala, A-M-Y, where your emotion centers are, those two blue structures. And that in order for emotional response to take place, first, you've got to be aware through your insula that you're having the feeling. And then you've got to have your S2 cortex and those two blue S structures, those are sensory cortex areas. Those sensory prefrontal cortex areas have to regulate the insular cortex. Those are the blue pathways for emotional regulation to occur. So for emotional regulation to occur, you've got to be aware of how you feel and have the tools to control it. Now, it turns out that stress affects the brain. And I mentioned the microglia as immune system. Well, here you can see that the brain through the adrenal glands affects the, the heart, all the liver, the stomach, the kidneys, the immune cells, and all that is picked up by the vagus nerve and sent back to the brain as a message as to this is what's going on in your body. And stress in the gut brain, you know, we know that the brain is more than just the neurologic part of the brain, but it connects to the gut. And the gut is related to functional GI disorders and all the endocrine, immune, autonomic nervous systems. And therefore, what we've learned about the biome, this living system within our gut helps determine how our brain works, how our emotions work, how our functions are. And so the stress in the gut-brain axis must be considered. So chronic stress is associated with a functionally imbalanced sympathetic parasympathetic, which is called the autonomic nervous system. Too much sympathetic, not enough parasympathetic. Stress in the brain, stress inflames the brain, and acupuncture quiets that inflammation. When there is pain, acupuncture helps our body release endorphins, naturally produced opiates. When things don't feel good, acupuncture helps our body release serotonin, naturally feel good hormone, that or a, a neurotransmitter. This was originally touted as why we were called the Prozac nation. Acupuncture and microglia, you know, I talked about the microglia is causing inflammation of the brain. Turns out that this inflammation of the brain seems to underlie most every condition of the brain, all the way from a stress condition to a depression condition, to an anxiety condition, to a traumatic brain injury condition, to a PTSD condition, to a, an overloaded stressed out condition, to a PTSD type story. And it turns out the acupuncture and microglia and the microglia are intimately related because acupuncture has powerful effects on the microglia. Here's an article about the protective role of acupuncture on spinal cord injury. Here's an article on acupuncture and microglial inhibition as a way of producing pain control. Here's an article on acupuncture in the prefrontal cortex of in stress-induced depressed rats and the effect of acupuncture. So acupuncture is a powerful tool for quieting these activated microglia. How about stress and consciousness? Well, stress without time for recovery, too massive or too sustained, produces distress. This results in inflammation of the brain. This affects the function of the brain. This affects the state of consciousness, and the state of consciousness affects mental health. So therefore, stress affects mental health. Now, I want to introduce you to some very simple acupuncture techniques that can be useful. This is called the Kaufman cocktail or the calming and centering technique. You can see that on the little figure on the left, there's two points on the head, a point on each hand, a point on each foot. And I'll go through these points. You can see the points on the head, GB20, GB24.5. The points on the hand are LI4 on both hands and on the feet, LR3 on both feet. And you can identify the location of LI4 as halfway along the second bone of your metatar metacarpal hand. And LI liver three is halfway along the second metatarsal bone of your foot. Let's go into more detail. 
Governor vessel 20 is at the very top of your head. It's the most heavenly point on the body. It's calming. It's used for anything intracranial. If you go from the lobe of the ear through the apex of the ear, it takes you all the way to the midline where governor vessel 20 is. It's where you're where you meet your ancestors according to tradition. Governor vessel 24.5 is between the brows. And the brows is, the name of this territory is called the glabella. It's in between the brows, interciliary. And if you go straight back, it's at the level of the hypothalamus. And this also is for calming. Now, when you put these two together, GV20, the point on the top, and GV24.5, the point between the eyes, you see where those two arrows target. It's a point deep inside the brain. It targets the hypothalamus, the center of the sympathetic nervous system activation path. So this is a powerful tool for quieting the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Ha! Huh. The points on the hands, LI4, and the points on the feet, liver three, are homologs. They're in similar places, halfway along the second metacarpal, halfway along the second metatarsal, and they target, you can see on the hand and on the foot, there's a large U-shaped red arterial arcade. This is a big, Blood, blood flow zone with lots of sympathetic fibers to control the regional blood flow. And by going in at these points, large intestine flow four and liver three, you target these peri-arterial sympathetic fibers. And once again, turn down sympathetic tone. So calming and centering, two points at the hypothalamus, four points for the peri-arterial sympathetic fibers, all designed to turn sympathetic tone down. This is a quote from Bob Kaufman who we named, we called the Kaufman cocktail after him. We taught him the uh, calming and centric treatment a week before he went off to uh, Afghanistan, Iraq actually. And he said, just yesterday, I took care of several soldiers involved in a complex IED attack that killed many of their fellow soldiers. Almost all had blown tympanic membranes with pounding headaches and assorted musculoskeletal injuries. They were extremely angry having been informed about the loss of their friends. With litters of breast, I proceeded to do ear points and my favorite, four gates and the requisite governed vessel cocktail points, GV20, GV24.5. The response was amazing. Zero to one headache pain down from seven or eight. No more shoulder or back pain. More importantly, a more subdued demeanor, which they hadn't experienced since being attacked three days earlier. So this shows you the potency of those simple techniques. Now in the Society for Acupuncture Research, this is a great source for evidence-based research in the field of acupuncture. Just looking up anxiety, they have these listings, general anxiety disorder, specific phobias, women's health and anxiety disorder, substance use disorder and anxiety disorder. And they find 30 studies concluded that acupuncture using a standardized approach is an effective tool in the management of patients who present with anxiety symptoms that have proven resistant to a number of other routine interventions. And its particularly valued response is seen with body and ear acupuncture. One point I'd like to make is that anything you ever read about the treatment of any mental health disorder is that it's not to be taken care of as a solo practic practical process, that it requires a setting of integrative care, multiple different kinds of practices, disciplines, and levels of attention and scrutiny that the patient needs for integration of care and services. What's the role of the brain in processing of trauma? Well, one, it remembers. Number two, it can be reconditioned or retrained. So this relates to the importance of pediatric and prenatal care. The polyvagal theory, which says that we related to the fact that the ventral vagus nerve came later and allowed social engagement. This is the work of Stephen Porges. And that it, what happens is that depending on how you go through your early life and go through early stressors, that determines how your sympathetic and parasympathetic system respond. And so if you learn, if you're conditioned to develop a response system that has insufficient vagal tone and excess activity of the sympathetic nervous system, that will create a bias of imbalance or dis-ease. And this re relates to the whole field of trauma-informed care. And though I learned about it from the military, it's cer certainly the case that trauma-informed care now, as we understand it, applies to everyone because everyone has been experienced of trauma at some way in form and time in their life. Now, I'd like to spend a few moments talking about the networks of the brain because it used to be thought the brain was like a switchboard. It came in one point, the wire went to the next point, connected it, and so on and so on. But now we know 
that there's broad structural work that takes place between multiple structures at the same time. Three of the main networks of the brain are called the default mode network off on the left with the red, the salience network in the middle with the yellow, and the central executive network with the blue. So the default mode network is self-referential mental activity daydreaming. Salience network is when suddenly there's a loud noise, a smell of smoke, a bright flash of light that calls your attention. And suddenly you switch your anterior insula and your cingulate cortex suddenly light up from what it had been. Central executive network says, I've got to do something. I've got to run. I've got to get out. Now you activated the parietal cortex and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So different parts of the brain are active during different states of the brain. The default mode network is a posterior cingulate, the posterior lateral parietal, the medial frontal, that's what's involved. Now the salience network breaks into the dream or task performance, calls for attention. I hear something, I see something, I smell something, I taste something, I want something, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. This is got your getting your attention. Executive network is when you're focused, taking your exam, taking your boards. So you can see that the central executive network in red is very different than the blue default mode network. And in fact, they're considered anti-correlated. They don't go on at the same time. If you're in default mode network, you're not in central executive. If you're in central executive, you're not in default mode network. And it turns out actually that in Alzheimer's disease, that this anti-correlation gets degraded and that the brain travels in between rather easily and may contribute to some of the confusion that we see in Alzheimer's. Now, the default mode network is mostly active, and it was discovered in 2015. That was the first time it was even discovered by Marcus Rakel. But it's most active when you're daydreaming. When you are looking at some research, and you go, oh, that's me. And you push the that's me button. That you're thinking of yourself. When you're on social media, you go, I like that. That's a default mode network. When you're, when you're remembering things in your own life, when you're imagining, when you're creating in your mind, default mode network. Less active when you're busy doing something, when you're losing your sense of self. And in meditation, as you're in yogic meditation, as you're withdrawing from the world, sometimes there's a stage where you can lose a sense of self and the meditation can lower the amplitude of the default mode network. But in frank psychosis, there's clearly a potential for losing yourself. And in psychedelics, that's partly how they're believed to have some of their effects by the breaking down of these rigid networks. Now, 90% of the brain's energy, 90%, most of the brain's energy supports the default mode network. That means the default mode network is the prime operator of the brain. It's involved in the maintenance of the brain's resting state organization. It's responsible for homeostasis. It's, re it's responsible for the time of self-repair. That's when self-repair is taking place. It's responsible for creating the healing state. It's responsible for creating a state where the brain and the system, the whole body and mind are in a state of readiness to receive. Now, the default mode network is suppressed during tasks requiring external attention, and it's activated when there's internally constructed representations. So the default mode network, here you see a picture of it on the right. If you tickle any of those nodes along the default mode network, you can get discrete emotions elicited. And so that supports the idea that the default mode network is the area where these emotions get conceptualized. And in fact, this may even be an area where the brain starts to make a predictive process and tries to make meaning of the affective state. So the affective state starts with the visceral reaction, only to be later identified by the amygdala as, uh, as an emotion, and then given a title and a label by the frontal cortex as sad or angry. So it helps make meaning of the affective state. So the default mode network creates an internal prediction or the likely result of the current action. So if you think that uh, if you go up to someone and say, how you doing, let's uh, be friends, and you expect that to result in a smile and a handshake, and instead you get slapped, that's a result of uh, a missed prediction. Now the default mode network shows increased connectivity from childhood to adolescence. In children, it's not well-developed. And like with myelination, it changes over time. So this speaks to the importance of pediatrics and prenatal care in helping to understand how the network is being fashioned and formed over time. 
A default mode network is an internal mental state. If I asked you, who are you? And you looked into yourself to identify yourself, default mode network. If I asked you, how do you feel? And you looked inside yourself, interoception, default mode network. If I asked you to tell me more about yourself autobiographically, default mode network. If I asked you to think about the future, default. And all the self-talk that goes on when you're not talking to someone else, you're going, gee, I think I'll talk about this later. Maybe I'll bring this up later. Oh, I think I should remember this. All that self-talk is default mode network. Now, the default mode network is not just the areas that are connected, but also the physiologic activity that they show. So the normal activity in the uh, default mode state is alpha activity, eight to 12 cycles per second in the brain. When you meditate, the amplitude goes down and may often disappear to the point of not being notable. When a person's depressed, they may spend too much time in the default mode network, and all they do is ruminate and talk about how depressed they are. Likewise with PTSD. In schizophrenia, as you see in this cartoon, the rhythm is too fast, it's way sped up. In Alzheimer's, it's too slow and it's disrupted. The default mode network, when there's too much, it's interesting, you can do self-talk at 300 to 1,000 words a minute. So when you're laying in bed at 3 a.m. and you're ruminating, most of that talk winds up being negative, identifying problems and their possible solutions, empathizing with other people in their circumstances, judging with a tendency towards a negative bias, creating st stories and worst case scenarios. When there's too little default mode network, this is, you're too stressed, too busy, not sleeping enough, no time to go there. So if you need to get into the default mode network, you need to withdraw from external stimuli, other cognitive processes and demands, take a nap, do some daydreaming. If you're too stuck in the default mode network, you need to get out in the world, go out in nature, experience awe, do some aerobic exercise, learn how to quiet the inner voice, possibly through meditation. Now, how about default mode network and trauma? So life experiences changes the default mode network of the brain and pain changes the brain and trauma, whether it's mental trauma or physical trauma, a concussion, a divorce, a job loss, a betrayal at work, a failed business, anxiety and depression, all these things change the brain. So trauma is individual and trauma is what assaults us. But after trauma, the brain network responsible for threat detection becomes linked to the default mode network. So the default mode network, which is normally just there when you're at peace and at rest, takes on extra connectors depending on the circumstance. So in pain, chronic pain patients oftentimes have trouble shutting off their default mode network. They're saying things to themselves like, why is this happening to me? What if it gets worse? How bad is my pain? Is it time for another pill? Should I call the doctor? What's going on? And then you make up self stories. I'm pretty sure this is a gnawing cancer eating my bones. I'm pretty sure I have parasites. I'm pretty sure this is a... Uh, inflammation. You make self-assessments. I think it's this. I think it's that. I think it's from this. I think it's from that. And self-problem solving. I better do this. I should do this. I should do that. This is what you're telling yourself and working through all the time. And obviously, some of these circumstances, as illustrated in these pictures, have to do with your work-life balance. Now, acupuncture in the default mode network. This is an imaging study that shows the yellow spots on the upper image is the insula. And that in a person with fibromyalgia, they're normally the insula is not part of the default mode network. But in people with chronic pain like fibromyalgia, the default mode network is at rest hooked up with the insula, which normally isn't part of it. And then if you give acupuncture that works, that the insular connectivity decreases and that correlates with the decreased amount of pain. So fibromyalgia patients have higher excitatory transmission in their insula because of glutamate. And that electroacupuncture balances that excess glutamate out by restoring inhibitory transmission, transmission capacity through GABA, through that pathway from the somatocentric cortex to the insula. And so when I first read these studies, I walked away with the notion that there's an abnormal linkage of the default mode network with the anterior insula in patients with chronic pain. That's fact. Here's the article below that states it and quotes it and demonstrates it. But what I didn't understand is that what's really happening is that 
Acupuncture doesn't just disconnect the insula from the default mode network, but acupuncture is actually normalizing the default mode network behavior. That in fact, acupuncture works by normalizing default mode network. And in fact, studies by Zhang Zhang Nierhaus uh, show that this was just 2019 shows that acupuncture supports physiologic homeostasis by working through the default mode network. So acupuncture is lower sympathetic tone and raises parasympathetic tone. This normalizes the autonomic nervous system, which provides a normalizing influence on the default mode network. Therefore, the acupuncture normalizes the default mode network. Now, this is one little funny little thing about the default mode network, that if you want to get someone to get into the default mode network, if you have them read a book that's about their core beliefs, that that triggers a default mode network. Like if you have someone that's a biblical scholar reading the Bible, that they will get into the default mode network. And it gets to a place where it's morally judging others and critical of others, and it activates the dorsal motor um, the default mode network when not in the idle state. I think that this explains something that happens in politics, that when a, you read something about your core belief and you start talking in this referential internal conversation about your core beliefs, I believe in this, I believe in this, I believe in this, I believe in this politic, I believe in this politic, that when you have someone talking to you from outside, you can't hear them because all you hear is your internal echo chamber. And that's another aspect of the default mode network when it's not working properly. Now, in order to get around that, you can do what's called non-judgmental default mode training. Turns out that meditation changes the brain and that mindfulness is a form of focused attention. And focused attention, while in the default mode network, is only seen in people that have this kind of mind-based training. So mindfulness can help us suffer less. And here you can see meditating pictures that the activity in the brain changes it from the control on the left to the meditator uh, meditation state on the right. So that the alternative state default mode network is non-judgmental while you're in a present awareness. So that in order to be non-pejorative in your thinking, do some mindfulness training, do some meditation training. So you're non-judgmental as you are developing your awareness. So when I talk about balancing your default mode network, the way to do it is through positive visual imaging, whether it's guided visual imaging or not, taking a nap, working on self-care, nutrition, activity, adequate rest, positive psychology, positive self-talk, meditation, exercise. And this type of exercise, and I'm talking now about yoga, tai chi, qigong, where the energetic, the meditative, the breathing quality is part of the exercise, in fact. Music, singing with others, making new connections, doing fun things, playing a character, all can be valuable for getting you out of your state of the default mode network and into a new state. How to optimize your default mode network. Relax, quiet the outer world, let your thoughts wander and engage in positive self-talk. Learn how to talk positively. I'm getting better every day. My back is feeling better. Oh, it's not cancer in there. I feel like little guys in there repairing it, building scaffolding to structure up and support my degenerating vertebrae. So you do positive self-talk to counteract the negative. So I'd like to pose this notion that the default mode network is the common element that helps explain expanded consciousness. It helps explain how we find our path to healing. It helps explain how we find our path to mental health, and it helps explain the role of acupuncture all through the default mode network. So my concluding statements are that acupuncture can positively affect mental health. It does this through the default mode network, the body's bodyguard. The default mode network functions poorly when stress levels are elevated, and it functions better after it's been after the patient has been treated with acupuncture. So better function of the default mode network can be restored with acupuncture. A healthy functioning default mode network is associated with better mental health. And a healthy functioning default mode network leads to a consciousness consistent with the path to healing. 
So I'm going to pause now and thank you for listening and being here tonight and ask any questions. Now, I left out a 10 little minute section on ear acupuncture. And if there's time later or interest, I'll be glad to talk about it. But for now, I'd be interested if there's questions. I know I've talked about a lot of uh, scientific material and as appropriate for medical school, even though it's a mini medical school, it's time to ask for some questions. Are there any questions? I have, I have a few questions I'll start with. You start. Um, so I just was trying to understand how you were talking about trauma and trauma affecting the default mode network and how that you showed the slide with the kind of the frequency of the brain waves change. And you also touched on the fact that the insula, the part of the, that part of the brain has higher connectivity with the default mode network in things like fibromyalgia and I'm guessing also in PTSD and things like that. So when, do we know in through acupuncture as a modality to, you know, potentially help treat someone with trauma, does it actually affect the brain waves to make it more, you know, like someone who's not having trauma or, you know, healing from trauma? Does it decrease that actual connectivity between the insula and the default mode network? What are, what, I'm just curious for you to kind of tease out a little bit more of the. There are the, two parameters. One is connectivity. So the idea is that you've got the default mode network that's at rest and when you're comfortable, relaxed and mellowed out, and that's where you are 90% of the time. Now, if you happen to have fibromyalgia or chronic pain, there's another part of your brain that's not supposed to be associated, but it's always gonna be there, the insula. Until you get your pain relief, then it's back to the default mode network. Now, I also showed that the amygdala and people that have had trauma, that they have increased threat detection. So the default mode network clings to the other structures that make it safer and protected. So the amygdala lights up with the default mode network when it's under threat or it's been trained to be under threat. So those are the connective things. And it's definitely been demonstrated that successful acupuncture, not unsuccessful acupuncture. So acupuncture that relieved the pain of the fibromyalgia sufferers was associated, was associated with a decreased connectivity of the insula to the default mode network. So that's the connectivity part. So yes, the connectivity is altered in the favorable direction by acupuncture. Number two, what about the frequency? So this is more than connectivity. This is the, the rhythm of the brain activity that's taking place in the part of the brain that's in the default mode network. And that acupuncture clearly has an effect on the brainwave activity itself. When you do acupuncture, you induce alpha and theta states. You don't induce delta sleep. You don't induce gamma thinking, beta thinking states. It's a relaxed, mellow state which is the default mode network, as it turns out, mm -hmm. relaxed and mellow. So the answer is yes, it affects both the connectivity and it affects the connectivity of, every, of anything that shouldn't be connected to the default mode network. And it affects the rhythm of the behavior of those structures. Can you talk a little bit about dosage also? Because I think part of what we're talking about or what we're talking about is neuroplasticity, right? So we're talking about consciousness, which I don't think people would say is a neuroplastic phenomena per se, which could maybe be argued, but what we're talking about is kind of this change in neuroplasticity of wiring that's happened, you know, in a way that's not helpful to somebody. And so to, to change the wiring, to have neuroplasticity in a favorable direction, you know, what, what sort of, you, you gave some examples of acupuncture versus electroacupuncture. And I'm curious about that I would say they both like a, work. They both a work. Dosage difference, and then also how you know how frequently are we talking about people getting treatments for for how long in terms of seeing some of these changes? So, in my opinion, like Bob Kaufman's report from Bagram, that people felt relief right away. Right away. So on the table, you feel like your default mode network is being healed. Now, does that heal it? No but it makes you feel like it has a possibility of being healed because mm -hmm. you feel better in that moment because you've had your sympathetic tone turned down both at the hypothalamic level and in the hand and foot level. Also, we did the ear protocol, which targets the parts of the brain that are most aggravated in extraordinary stress. And those two things together, lower the stress or level, change the tone in the room. So the theory is that if you have, Un, 
managed material, it will serve as a nidus for irritability down the road and further problems down the road because it was never dealt with. If you can quiet the event and all of its sturm and drang right at the beginning, then you can prevent it from having its negative associations and long-term implications for the rest of that person's life. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to affecting a person globally in a more long-term sense, it's more than just an acupuncture treatment. This is where integrative care comes in. This is why integrative care is what is required because this is all, this is everybody on board. This requires mm -hmm. dietary, this requires physical activity, mental activity, social activity, community activity, cultural activity, as well as acupuncture and all the other things that need to, family activities and all these things need to be worked on. So the idea with the polyvagal notion is that because of our world and the way we've been learned, we, the way we learn how to respond, that people have oftentimes learned how to respond to stressors in a way that's <laughs> and very sympathetic and not very calm and mellow at all and overreactive and self-stressing and traumatizing. Mm -hmm. And that if you can help a person say, oh, you don't have to react quite like that. You could take some deep breaths. Oh, let me help you. Oh. No, no, it's, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. We'll get through this together. Instead of saying everything is terrible, just say, so it'll be okay. Use some positive self-talk. So there are ways of starting at the very earliest stage of helping to uh, observe how a person's default mode ne network manages stressors because mm -hmm. each person manages it a different way. And then helping to secure a therapeutic strategy to modify that along the way. Mm -hmm. But certainly... Anytime you can see a person at who's been acutely stressed and you can lower their level of stress activation, you can lower the imprinting on their nervous system of that activity. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to one of the questions from our participants. I have heard it's important for the practitioner to practice energy work like Tai Chi or Qigong in order to put Qi or energy into the needles. Can you speak to this? Yeah, I can speak to that. I, it is important for the practitioner to do energy work because they're recommending it to their patient. So what what kind of a life is it where you say, you should do that, but I'm not going to because mm, I don't need to. That's that's like uh, walking the walk. So it's, and, and energy work, just like it's good for patients, is good for practitioners and caregivers too, because it helps build their energy up. Now, giving energy to patients is a tricky matter. Because certainly when you interact with a patient, I, I, this is something I learned from my wife. She teaches me a lot. One of her professors talked about the psychoanalyst sitting in his chair, brain buzzing, heart beating, muscles twitching, lungs breathing. And in walks the patient, brain buzzing, heart beating, lungs breathing, muscles twitching. And they come into the room together and they're looking for some kind of synchrony and synchronization. And in that synchronization, there is a place that's called the therapeutic space. And that's where therapy, therapeutic process can occur. And that synchronized place takes place between caregiver and care receiver all the time, whether it's acupuncture, psychotherapy, manual therapy, Reiki therapy, yoga therapy, it's part of the process. And that that has to be accounted for in the calculation and that it's certainly possible to be depleted at the end of a long day. But if you're careful, the energy that you're using is energy from the universe and you're just harnessing it and directing it into the patient. It doesn't have to come from you personally. Otherwise, at the end of every day, you'd be on life support. Uh, you know, I, I can't imagine that. Now, I know that people have different views of this, and I've had professors put aluminum foil around their dantian to prevent vampires from taking their energy. But as a practitioner who would treat, you know, 15, 20 patients a day with serious problems, I didn't have that particular problem. So I think that the idea of the universe as the healing source and us as the conduits is a more comfortable place for me to be rather than me. I am going to be the one that's going to heal you and you're going to get healed by me. First of all, that's a foreign notion. The idea of doctor healing patients. Uh, I like the idea of partnerships. 
I like the idea of we're in this together. We're going to work together for our goal that you've identified, and we're going to work towards this goal. You're going to do a lot of work. I'm going to give you counsel and advice and guidelines and some recommendations. You're going to have to do the work, but it can be done. And I'm going to give you some positive self-talk advice. Maybe I'll do some hypnosis. Maybe I'll give you some yoga breathing. Maybe I'll teach you some Tai Chi. Maybe I'll do some acupuncture on you. It's all part of what we're going to need to build together this program, which we're going to call your life to help you live a life that is more consistent with what you're hoping for. Wonderful. I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more. I remember when I did, when I trained with, with you in the course, just, I was really struck by the um, work that was done for the military folks that were in active duty and veterans. And I know that a lot of the ear auricular, uh, auricular therapy that's done is, um, you know, it's really wonderful to use with folks that may be on active duty and things because it's so accessible. And I, it, I just, I found it so interesting and so wonderful. And also just, I was so surprised to learn about it. Um, you know, as a person that's not involved with that sort of care, those sorts of patients. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. In uh, 2010, I was at a retreat with the, uh, the senior uh, acupuncture teachers when we got a call from the Department of Defense. General Green said, we need an acupuncture treatment for PTSD. Now, we had just delivered a, a large lecture six months earlier to a military acupuncture program, and I was one of the lecturers. As a neuroscientist in the group, I talked about the neuroscience of uh, PTSD. And so in the group, the leader of the group turned to me and said, so which points should we use? And I was like, Whoa. I looked at somebody else. Nobody else was answering me. So I said, well, I know this. The hypothalamus is overactive, the, the source of that sympathetic nervous system. The amygdala, the fear zone, overactive. The hippocampus, the memory zone, overactive. The prefrontal cortex, the regulatory zone, underactive. So I made those the first four points. And we added two basic points of Shen Men, the spirit gate, and point zero, the center of the ear. And so we said, this is for PTSD. Did I know what it was going to do? I had no idea what it was going to do. And so we did it. We launched it in several venues. We launched it at the Intrepid Center, a concussion center in Afghanistan. We launched it at the Walter Reed uh, uh, Wounded Warriors uh, Intrepid Center. And we did it at Nellis Air Force Base. So we did it out in the field with acute trauma. We did it in wounded warrior back in the States for you know really seriously wounded people. And we did it in a family medicine clinic over a longitudinal period of time over 10 years at Nellis Air Force Base. And what they found consistently was that the patients had less pain, needed less pain medicine, had less anxiety and depression, had fewer surgeries and consultations, and that their in, in general, their demeanor and their state of calm and peace was greater. So that they reported, uh, I think it was 46% reduction in opiate use. And uh, this was pretty dramatic because this was at the height of the opiate crisis. And Las Vegas was one of the main offending zones. So this resulted in a, almost a half a 50% reduction in opiate use. It reduced the, do, the use of benzodiazepines like Valium, but opiates were really profoundly, the use and their requests were profoundly affected. And I think it's because there was better treatment. And it turns out that this treatment works at this lower level of the brain and brain stem where trauma is processed where the gets it gets in it's getting in through your gut a gut feeling Ugh, i hate that person it's i hate them in my guts and then it's like oh i feel about this i think about it and i have a cognitive thought but it starts with a gut feeling and gut feelings are registered registered in your old brain so that's why we picked the points on the old brain part of the ear. And I don't think it's ever been done before and it's proven to be very effective it's the single largest the single most common treatment that graduates of our training program administer now. And we've developed it. I've taken it and gone from the basic ATP, auricular trauma protocol, and call and now have a, the basic auricular trauma protocol for sleep, basic for stress, basic for pain, and basic for dependency. And I'm going to be presenting that work internationally in September at, in Copenhagen. 
and for the participants that maybe aren't familiar with how the ear is set up in Chinese medicine, you, maybe you have an ear on hand. I do, I do. Being able to show folks that the, the ear, the whole body is actually represented on the ear um, and can be treated as if you just even Google like ear. So here's, a, here's an ear, a plastic ear. And here's the ear lobe. And here's the top of the ear. And the whole body is on the ear. It's like an upside down fetus. Here's the head and here's the feet up at the top. So the brain is down here. So these red points are brain stem points. These are the ATP points, some of them. And there's another one on the inside. Those are the ATP points on the ear. And so the thing about the ear is that part of the reason it was developed was that it was for the military. It was meant for application downrange. So someone wounded in the field waiting for evacuation with pain or stress or you know freaking out, they need to have something done. You're not gonna take off their uniform, no. But their ear is available. They can keep their boots on. They can keep their other stuff on. Just need the ear. And it turns out that the ear is connected to the brain in unique ways. It's the only part of the body where the three layers of the embryo can be found. The endoderm, the guts, the mesoderm, the connective tissue, and the ectoderm, the nervous system and the skin. Thank you. Okay, there's a couple more participant questions. I think the next two questions actually might go together, so I'll read them. Wondering how trauma or ACEs during important periods of growth and development, for example, in adolescence, might affect the default mode network and effectiveness of acupuncture and other default mode network balancing treatments. And then another participant asks, what about kids and PTSD and acupuncture? So the answer is yes. ACE, adverse childhood experiences, these are trauma. You can call them ACE if you like. I call them trauma. And uh, every trauma you have as a human being affects you and it conditions your brain. You're plastic. Your brain is learning. It's learning how to help you survive. If you're in a traumatic world where lots of things can happen to you that are dangerous on a regular basis, it probably is a good idea for you to have a pretty high level of threat detection so that you're not going to get killed right away. But if that's how you're raised, then you're always on edge. You can't be relaxed. You can't chill out for so very easily. So yes, this affects how you are as a child. It affects how you are as an adult and it affects how acupuncture works. Acupuncture won't work quite as well if you're not available, but acupuncture is designed to bring you back to be available. The, stra the strategy that we use in acupuncture mostly is the first layer of strategy is calming the patient down. Just like in the book, in the books and the works of Bessel van der Kolk, the body uh, keeps the score. Trauma can be worked on, but only after the anxiety level is lowered. If the patient's all wound up, you can't get through to them. So the first thing is calming them, like calming and centering. The second thing is finding out if they've got blocks, like things that are pathologic stuff like deep-seated problems that you got to find out about histories of abuse, histories of, you know, male treatment, histories of, you know, family histories, all sorts of stuff like that, that need to be worked through before you can even get to the symptoms that they might be complaining of. So there are stages you have to get to when you're working with a patient, whether it's with psychotherapy, EMDR, acupuncture, or yoga, or, or psilocybin. Mm -hmm. There's another question in the chat. It's a somewhat of, I think, kind of a personal question, but I'll read it. Maybe you can respond in a general, you know, kind of sense. But a participant sharing that they've had a diagnosis of cancer quite a while ago and just curious about how acupuncture might assist with the healing process of that. Um, and then also talking about will, the, will insurance cover acupuncture? Uh, insurance sometimes covers acupuncture, sometimes not. Uh, depends on what kind of insurance you have. Kaiser Permanente covers some acupuncture diagnoses. Uh, Blue Cross covers some acupuncture diagnoses. Medicare covers some acupuncture diagnoses. Uh, the insurance uh, is not reliable and terribly predictable. Um, it is, however, not terribly expensive and can be uh, managed along, if you work with your provider, uh, you can figure out a way to uh, get this in an affordable way because the acupuncture becomes an important tool because uh, the first question is about healing. And healing is a complex issue. Healing is not just about the scar 
the edges of the wound coming together and uh, you're all better. I, you know, I, I have my own feeling about scars and healing. It, it, when I first was giving this lecture, I prepared a picture that showed a wound, an actual a, a cut and how it healed. I was gonna make a metaphor about how other things heal. But the reality is, is that things heal, but they never go away. Scars persist. You can minimize the scar, you can make it smaller, but it won't go away because it's left its mark. It's left its mark and that's okay. So the goal is to understand the marks that it's made and, and work on those territories. So there's the cognitive, we know about these things. There's the emotional. In America, we tend to underestimate the emotional component of what goes on. The emotional part of healing is huge. And turns out that there's some tricks, not tricks, but there's some not commonly used acupuncture tools that can facilitate the emotional aspect of healing, like the outer bladder line spirit points, the outer external kidney spirit points, upper kidney spirit points. Because the, the Chinese acupuncture approach understood, it was way before the Western medicine that came along and said, well, there's people that study the mind and there's people that study the body. And you know those are psychiatrists and psychologists, and then there's everybody else. And they don't really talk to each other, and you're either in one camp or the other. The Chinese said, well, actually, they never said that because they didn't think that. Mind and body are the same. If this is me, this is looking at me from the mind, this is looking at me from the body, I'm all just one person with mind and body and spirit. And so no matter how you look at me, I can be seen from different perspectives, but I'm a combination of all those things all the time. And if you're going to treat me with a spiritual technique, it's going to affect my mind and my body. If you're going to affect, treat me with a mental technique, it's going to affect my spirit and my body. If you're going to affect me or treat me with a bodily technique, it's going to affect my spirit and my mind. So they're all connected. That's how it works. That's how it's supposed to work. But the issue of scarring, it's okay to remember the wounds that have happened. As long as you don't get stuck, stuck, so that you're just ruminating on, oh, woe is me, my sad life. I had that. I'm still healing. I should be doing this. I can't do that. Why can't I do that? I'm doing that. That's negative self-talk. That's a default mode network working again you. You want to say, hey, I'm here. I'm at this lecture. I survived this. I'm feeling better. I'm going to feel better tomorrow. Positive self-talk is really important. Really important. Do you think acupressure also affects just like a person doing self-acupressure or receiving it affects the default mode network? Absolutely. So the network of points and channels is available, okay? So needles is just one way to approach them. Needles is what acupuncturists use. But the fact is, is that when you go to an acupuncturist, most of the time after you get your treatment, they send you home, they say, you massage here and rub there and work on those points. So you, they teach you self-massage. So massaging the points, massaging the channels, these are all practices known as shiatsu in Japanese and twina. But the manual work on the body is very powerful. Also, you can work on points besides with needles. You can do manual. You can put beads, seeds, magnets on body points or ear points. You can use little intradermal needles, Pyonex that have a, a one millimeter little teeny needle stub or a one and a half millimeter needle stub that just barely goes into the skin. And needles are the best, most potent, with lesser potency as they get less invasive, but they're still powerful even when they're manual and no poking at all. So that all the tools are better than doing nothing and doing something is better than nothing. And even though there's a gradation, the other consideration is that let's say you have a pediatric patient. You say, well, I've got this great treatment it involves eight needles. And they say, sorry, no needles. So you've got a great treatment, but they can't avail themselves of it. So you've got to be able to meet your patient where they are, where they can accept and receive something that you have to offer. I remember when I learned from my Tai Chi teacher, I was going to tell him about all these fancy ear treatments I had invented. He said, yeah, that's that's nice. This is what we do. We have a, an upper ear treatment, a back ear treatment, and a lower ear treatment. And it's like, oh. <laughs> so I think there are many ways, is I guess my bottom line here. There are many ways. There's not just one way to this path of healing that we're all interested in achieving. 
great. That's a humble, that's a humbling response. <laughs> There's another question in the chat. I'll just read off. Is there a correlation? This I love this question. Is there a correlation between the pain felt of acupuncture um, or acupressure points with the effectiveness of healing or improving the default mode network? I can tell you that if you are if you have sciatica and you're laying in a functional MRI unit with your sciatica and they can see that your default mode network is, is hooked up to the insula because you're in pain. And then some sadistic doctor comes in and does a straight leg raising on you to aggravate your sciatica. The insula will get even more connected to the default mode network. And as the pain is relieved, it will get less connected. So I'm thinking that the more pain there is, the more potential separation there could be. It's definitely the degree of connectivity is definitely a reflection of the intensity of the pain. And in fact, if you want to do insula testing, if you ask a patient in an MRI and say, just imagine you're in pain, their insula will light up. Then if you say to them, imagine it's really bad pain, their insula will light up a lot and get it attached to their default mode network in the imaginary state. Yeah, there's a technique that some practitioners use, correct, that's like finding points that are tender and then saying like, yes, that is that is called an ashi point and that's where we're going to needle because you're tender there. And in terms of like getting a better quote clinical result or more kind of efficacious treatment. There's been extensive literature in the last couple of years to confirm that in fact, there's a difference at acupuncture points compared to non-acupuncture points, that they have uh, neural properties, that they have mast cells that release histamine. So the redness is from histamine and, and that they are sites of inflammation. There are low levels of inflammation that define where the acupuncture points are. And the other thing is, is that, you know, you may see an acupuncture point here and that's where the needle goes in. But the acupuncture point is not where it just goes through the skin. It's where the needle tip winds up. So if it winds up, you know, an inch towards my wrist, but it comes in here, but it ends up an inch towards my wrist, this is the point. Comes in here, but it ends up there. That's the point. So that's something that you can actually feel as a practitioner and as a receiver. The receiver will go, oh, that's the point. The practitioner will go, oh, I feel that grab on that needle. I found the point. You found the point. We agree. It's the point. That's the point. Perfect. Anything else before we wrap up tonight? Final thoughts, words of wisdom? My final <laughs> thoughts are that I, at one point in time during the pandemic, I tried to get this ear protocol to go viral with some friends. And we came up with a CRDP, the Coronavirus Rapid De-Stress Protocol, mm -hmm. which was the things I've talked about tonight with you, this group. And these are powerful tools. And we've taught them to naive practitioners virtually and they're the thing i want to make the point about is that the master still uses the same basic simple treatments as mm -hmm. anybody else they just do with more confidence so these are simple treatments but they are profoundly potent and useful and if you want to look up when you get the the printout of my uh powerpoint you'll see a reference to the crdp and you can it's free. You can look at the YouTube video of how to do these procedures. Cool. Wonderful. That's my know. So everybody, thank you so much. This has been an amazing series of, of how to take care of our mental health. There's nothing more important than our mental health because it is our health, not just our mental health. It's our health. So I thank you, Jen, for putting this together yes, for us. I thank you, Dr. Elkis. And I want to just thank the Osher Center and the whole administrative team that helped put the talk series together and for the participants for joining. Just really appreciate all the time and effort from everybody and for folks taking the time out of their busy evenings for everybody. Us. Yes. So thank you. And so until we meet again. <laughs>